Greetings. Uh, greetings from the Mark 79, the next installment of the 1840s in the course on the history of Catholicism in the United States. Uh, we got up last time to the election year of 1844, which resulted in the election of President Number 11, uh, James Knox Polk. He was born in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, graduated from the University of North Carolina, became a lawyer, admitted to the bar in 1820. After five years in private practice, he entered politics as a Jacksonian Democrat, winning election to the House of Representatives in 1825. He served 14 years in the House, including uh, the last four as Speaker of the House. He left Congress and relocated to Tennessee, which was Andrew Jack where Andrew Jackson lived, the retired two-term president. And there Polk was elected governor of Tennessee in uh, 1839. In the 1844 election, the Whigs, you remember the, the Whig Party was the um, successor to the Federalist, so the Whigs believed in a strong central government, national bank, uh, you know, uh, funding, infrastructure, bridges, canals, later railroads, uh, funding that nationally, which means funded through tax theft. Uh, so the Whigs ran Henry Clay, and the Jacksonian, the Democrats, uh, under the influence of Andrew Jackson, ran James Polk, who was a, a loyalist of Jackson. Polk achieved a narrow victory only because of a third-party candidate. James Burney ran for a third party called the Liberty Party, which drew enough votes away from Clay to secure Polk's victory. As president, Polk uh, changed history, uh, and it's, it's astonishing how much he accomplished um, through both war and diplomacy. Uh, I mean, I'm not, you know, just not a moral, to, but I mean, just he he added significantly to the United States in ways that uh, that changed history, as we shall see. Uh, a few fun facts about him before we focus most of our uh, interest on what affects church history. On August 10th, 18 On uh, August 10th, 1846, uh, as president, James Polk signed a measure uh, establishing the Smithsonian Institute in War in uh, Washington DC. The Congress had uh, chartered the institution. Uh, Congress had, normally uh, states charter corporations, but the D.C. is a federal city. It's not, not part of a state, so Congress had to issue the charter. Uh, Smith, it was... Uh, his name, the Smithsonian, was named after an English scientist named James Smithson lived from 1765 to 1836. In his will, he left a bequest of half a million dollars, which in 1836 was a lot of money, uh, to make this possible. The Smithsonian Institute was therefore born. Joseph Henry became its first secretary. The cornerstone of the first of the Smithsonian buildings was laid in Washington, D.C. on May 1st, 1847, the building was designed by James Renwick, Jr. The following year, on Independence Day, July 4th, 1848, the President Polk laid the cornerstone of the Washington Monument in D.C. Each state of the Union was invited to donate a memorial stone. In design, it's a white marble obelisk, 555 feet tall, 55 feet square at the base. Uh, because the uh, Civil War intervened, it was uh, d delayed. It was not completed until 1884. The public was first admitted to the monument on October 9, 1888. The architect Robert Mills designed it. 
<clears throat> although he died you know long before it was completed and uh, another fun fact on, on December 29th 1849 Polk had gas lighting installed in the White House by choice Polk did not run for a second term owing to ill health he retired to Tennessee and died three months later okay so he's elected 1844 now uh, focusing on church history <clears throat> um, 1845, uh, Bishop Odin, uh, we've, we've already met, um, that, well, at the, at the time he was apostolic vicar of the Republic of Texas. In 1845, he went to Europe to raise money and, and recruits for the missions in Texas. As uh, we know, Texas eventually became part of the United States, but they didn't know that at the time. If thought, okay, it's a new country. In fact, Texas is larger than than some European countries. So it was a plausible to, to think that. And how, you know, Dean's the only bishop in the state, although still an apostolic vicar. Among the recruits from this trip included Claude Dubuis, who followed Odin. Uh, Odin uh, became Bishop of Galveston, the founding bishop in Texas, um, and uh, Dubuis followed him as the second bishop. Another of the recruits, Jean-Claude Neray, N-E-R-A-Z, uh, later became Bishop of San Antonio, Texas, served from 1881 to 1894. While Odin was gone on this trip to Europe, the Republic of Texas decided that its future would be with the United States. Negotiations between the Republic of Texas and the Republic of the United States had been in progress for over a year. The plan was that Texas would be admitted as a state along with Florida, which the United States had uh, well purchased Florida, uh, purchased Florida from uh, Spain, and then uh, fought a, uh, a war against the Seminole, the indigenous uh, tribes in Florida. Uh, and, and finished defeating them three years earlier uh, in 1842. The last group of them surrendered on August 14th of that year. Uh, but both both Texas and Florida are south of the Mason-Dixon line. So you remember we covered in the 1820s the Missouri Compromise, which, uh, which sought to maintain a balance between slave states in the south and free states in the north. So admitting two states... South of the line means that two states north of the line had to be admitted. So in keeping with that, the plan was to admit Iowa and Wisconsin to maintain the balance. But the problem of Mexico remained. A problem because Mexico had never recognized the independence of Texas. Uh, I should, let's see. So uh, uh, this is just a, a boundary map, not topographical, but it, it suffices. So, uh, so here's uh, Mexico. Now, at the time, well, as in the colonial period, Spain uh, had uh, all of this part of, of the uh, United States, what later became the United States, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and, and all this, over to, including California, but not Washington and Oregon. That was a separate territory. So up to the northern border, of uh, what, the, what they called Alta California, Upper California, to distinguish it from Baja California, which is lower. Uh, so all this was uh, considered part of the Republic of New, what part of the province of New Spain. And when Mexico achieved its independence in 1821, created a republic, uh, they claimed all of this as their territory, including Texas. And as we saw in the um, uh, in the decade of the 1830s, uh, we covered all the details about Texas seceding and um, Mexico not recognizing that. Uh, so by accepting uh, Texas as, as a 
you know, part of the United States, it could, you know, plausibly be considered an act of war because Mexico would uh, regard that as, as, as stolen territory. <clears throat> All right. Before, and indeed it did lead to a war, uh, which we'll cover in due course, but um, sticking with the chronology, uh, something that's going to affect both secular and religious history in the United States uh, occurred in, uh, in Europe uh, beginning in 1845 and continuing to 1849, a fungus blighted the potato crops across Europe. Uh, and if it's called the Irish potato famine, not because it was only in Ireland, but uh, the the potato at the time was a was a you know staple food for the for the Irish, so it affected them more as that their agriculture uh, was not as diversified because it was you know occupied territory. And then used, um, you know, just used to service the British uh, export economy. So uh, this caused a catastrophic famine uh, in everywhere, uh, but it, it was more catastrophic in Ireland because of political decisions that were made. Specifically, the British government refused to alter its food exporting policy to provide relief. So they did have other food. So I mean, not the potato, but they had other food sources. Uh, from other parts of the of the of the realm, but uh, they continue to export those for commercial profit rather than diverting it and just sending to the Irish to maintain their lives. This was deliberate matter of policy, um, and so they watched as one and a half million Irish starved to death out of a population of nine million. Another two million fled Irish; they just fled Ireland to you know to survive. And many of them ended up in in the United States, and since it was uh, the 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 oppressed strata of the population are the ones who were victimized by this, and they were Catholic because they were under a uh, the the British occupation, uh, many of the, the 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 overwhelming majority of the the Irish who fled and ended up in the United States were Catholic Irish. So there are a number of primary source accounts, eyewitness accounts of this, uh, or read reading ec- excerpts from a few of them. Uh, the first one is from Frederick Douglass, who was uh, a slave, an American slave, uh, then escaped slavery, and became a very prominent uh, social, moral, and political uh, observer and recorder, uh, speaker, activist uh, of, of the day. In August of 1845, he wrote the following about the potato famine. I have heard much of the misery and wretchedness of the Irish people. But I must confess, my experience has convinced me that the half has not yet been told. Here you have an Irish hut or cabin, such as millions of the people of Ireland live in, in much the same degradation as the American slaves. I see much here to remind me of my former condition, meaning, you know, Douglas had been a slave. And I confess I should be ashamed to not lift my voice against American slavery, but that I know the cause of humanity is one the world over. He who really and truly feels for the American slave cannot steel his heart to the woes of others. Uh, Another one, this is from... uh, a uh, Coast Guard officer. Uh, Captain Robert Mann, M-A-N-N. And uh, uh, this was his observation in County Clare in 1846. Quote, I shall never forget the change in one week in August. On the first occasion, on an official visit of inspection, I had passed over 32 miles, thickly studded with potato fields in full bloom. The next time, the face of the whole county had changed. The stalk remained green, but the leaves were all scorched black. It was the work of a single night. Distress and fear were pictured on every countenance, and there was a great rush to dig and sell or consume the crop by feeding pigs and cattle, fearing in a short time they would prove unfit for any use. Now, this is uh, another 
uh, from October 1846 from a, a, a newspaper, the Waterford Freeman. Waterford, you know, Ireland, uh, Freeman. Uh, quote, when famine is spreading its pall over the land and death is visiting the poor man's cabin, is it not meet that the food of millions should be shipped from our shores? It, it, is, it is not meet. Um, I know that's a, it is not meat in the sense of it is not fitting. It is not meat, it is not fitting that the food of millions should be shipped from our shores. It is indispensably necessary that grain should remain in the country while scarcity is apprehended. Will not a starving population become justly indignant when whole fleets laden with the produce of our soil are unfurling their sails and steering away from our shores while the cry of hunger is lamenting in their ears? It is beyond human endurance to suffer it. And a wise government should at once issue an order prohibiting the exportation of provisions from this country until the wants of the people have been sufficiently provided for. End quote. So that's as an eyewitness. You know, so it, it was not all food. It was not a, not a general famine, you know, caused by some drought. And, and it was like nothing was growing. No, this was a fungus that was just attacking the potato. But they, they, they did still have grain. But the British economy, because of the, the corn law, which is, that's a whole nother, anyway, the, um, because of that, they were pra- still practicing mercantilism, a protectionist economy, that they, they, they the, the, the UK government was subsidizing the, uh, the wheat industry for export. It was a cash crop. And the government profited from that, you know, through tax theft, through excise taxes on the exports. So if they would reverse it, instead of exporting that, they would lose doubly. So they, they would lose the businesses in, engage the shipping businesses engaged in the export they would not make money so that would be that would mean income that could not be taxed but uh, then uh, also the government would not get its cut its excise directly you know from from the, uh, the tax theft of the of the exports itself so it was a dub, double tax they were missing and and why they only, they would do it only to save the lives of the Irish peasants and the Irish peasants were uh, you know, third-class citizens in their own country because it was occupied territory, and they were Catholic, and the ascendancy were were Irish, either I mean, either Irish Protestants or English Anglo Protestants or Scottish Protestants. So why why you know lose money just to keep more Irish Catholics alive? From their perspective, it's it's much more it's much better to just to make money and export. And if if you know a million Irish die, well, yeah, okay. But that's yeah. so clearly, you know, the, the work of the demonic. Uh, this is one uh, eyewitness account. This guy was a justice of the peace in Cork, Ireland, December 1846. Uh, Nicholas Cummings wrote the following, uh, referring to the village of Skibberdeen, quote, I entered some of the hovels and the scenes that presented themselves were such as no tongue or pen can convey the slightest idea of. In the first, six famished and ghastly skeletons, to all appearance dead, were huddled in a corner on some filthy straw, their sole covering what seemed a ragged horse cloth and their wretched legs hanging about naked above the knees. I approached in horror and found by a low moaning that they were still alive. They were in fever, four children, a woman, and what once had been a man. It is impossible to go through the detail. Suffice it to say that in a few minutes I was surrounded by at least 200 such phantoms, phantoms, such frightful specters as no words can describe. By far the greatest number were delirious, either from famine or from fever. Their yells are still ringing in my ears, and their horrible images are fixed in my brain. Um... Okay, uh, this the, the, have a, this is one uh, from a, a report of a priest, a Catholic priest in Canada, at a, a Gross Isle. That's G R O S S E, but it's French. Gross, not as, as it's, uh, gross, just means uh, big. So Big Island, uh, Canada, and so the, he. This is seeing the other end. That those Irish who met, who escaped, you know, trying to come either to Canada or the United States. 
Uh, so this is his observation, quote, two to three hundred sick might be found on one ship attacked by typhoid fever, by dysentery, most lying on the refuse that had accumulated under them during the voyage. Now, refuse, that means their, their own excrement. Beside the sick and the dying were spread out the corpses that had not yet been buried at sea. On the decks, a layer of muck had formed so thick that footprints were noticeable in it. To all this, add the bad quality of the water, the scarcity of food, and you will conceive, but feebly, of the sufferings that people endure during the long and hard trip. Sickness and death made terrible inroads on them. In some ships, almost a third of the passengers died. The crew members themselves were often in such bad shape that they could hardly man the ship. Okay. Uh, so what happened those that managed to survive and, and make it to the United States? Uh, the Irish uh, were viewed, uh, the refugees of the potato famine were viewed as an urban blight by the Protestant ruling class in the United States. And they, they responded defensively by imposing an apartheid policy on the Irish Catholics, uh, similar to that imposed on blacks in the South by means of the Jim Crow laws. Now, with the Irish, it would not last uh, as long as the Jim Crow did, as the Irish arrived already speaking English. Uh, they congregated in cities and formed self-aware uh, urban ghettos that uh, became neighborhoods centered on Catholic parishes. The parish became the center of the Irish neighborhoods. And then they quickly organized themselves politically and attained elected office. So there they had... There was the advantage they had over the over the, uh, the blacks in the South is is that as bad as the Irish were treated, uh, they were never legally slaves. So they did experience uh, legally imposed apartheid in that they were not allowed in to certain buildings or certain jobs they couldn't hold, but they had never been property. Uh, so they did not have to overcome that legal disability. Um, so which means they could be citizens; they could become naturalized citizens which, of course, the slaves could not until after the Civil War. Uh, and so the Irish were able to uh, uh, enter politics, and then once they had, you know, that, then they could, they could improve their situation. But this, this model uh, of, of a neighborhood concentration, community self-sufficiency, political organization, was imitated by many subsequent waves of immigrants, Germans, Poles, Italians, etc., and that's how they assimilated into the United States. By the time of the Third Council of Baltimore in 1883, the Irish completely dominated the American Catholic hierarchy. Uh, there were 76 bishops, Catholic bishops in the United States at that, well, they didn't all go, but at the time that council met, there were 76 bishops, and 33 of them had been born in Ireland. And then a few more, their parents had been born in Ireland, so they were they were still they were pure-blooded Irish, but born in the United States. Uh, during the potato famine, uh, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth died, uh, June first, eighteen forty-six. He was followed as Pope two fifty-five by Pius the Ninth. Pius the Ninth lived to see the United States fight a war with Mexico, and then tear itself apart in a civil war. His insistence on proper canonical order forced the bishops of the United States to hold three plenary councils. Uh, plenary just means uh, full. Plenum means full. So uh, an assembly of all the bishops in the United States. They met at Baltimore. That was the mother, is the mother of the first Catholic diocese within the borders of the United States. The three plenary councils held at Baltimore were 1852, 1866, 1884. And in terms of uh, general church history, Pius IX is also the one who summoned the first Vatican Council in 1869 and in, in, into 1870. It was uh, never completed, uh, was interrupted by, this, that's a long story, but I'll cover that in another playlist in the modern history playlist. Anyway, uh, back to the United States. And President Polk and Mexico 
On November 10th, 1845, President Polk uh, sent, uh, made an offer to Mexico. He sent as ambassador uh, a man named John Slidell. So those of you from Louisiana, Slidell, Louisiana is named for this guy. Slidell was uh, born in New York, but then uh, as he, he, as a young man, he moved to Louisiana, made his life here. He served as a representative and a senator, and, uh, and now we meet him as an ambassador. Uh, Polk wanted to purchase the, uh, the area I showed you on the, on the maps earlier, what is now the western United States, over to California, uh, just as Jefferson had purchased uh, the Louisiana Purchase, you know, from the Gulf to the Great Lakes, the, and uh, Florida had been purchased. So now Polk just wanted to do that, just just simply buy all that territory. And this would uh, correspond to the, what became the states of New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, uh, Colorado. Now, the Mexican government was not in a position to agree to this because the nation established as uh, the United Mexican States after Mexico seceded from Spain, fought a war with Spain, you know, created a republic. Uh, they codified, Mexico codified a constitution on October 4th, 1824. But by the time, 20 years later, when Polk makes this offer, that government was in a death spiral. Um, so just a, a brief uh, summary. Following that new constitution of 1824, four years after its creation, 1828 was an election year. <clears throat> All right, now I have to. The, the, at this point, the, the, you know, they had political parties, you know, so they're imitating. They want to be like the American Republic because they had been a colony of Spain, which had imposed serfdom on them. You know, it was not a free society, so they, they broke away from Spain. And there were parts of the population in Mexico that wanted to, to be like the United States, have more personal freedom, uh, you know, property ownership, etc. Uh, so the, the, there were multiple parties, which is a, a, a difference. Like we, we pretty much uh, had the two-party system, and third parties, you know, generally don't make it here. Uh, but the uh, and, and to understand the Mexican situation, the issue was land. So when when Spain, you know, in the late 15th century into the 16th century, when Spain conquered Mexico, made it a province of the empire. Uh, feudalism was still the mode of government in Europe. And Spain imposed feudalism in Mexico. And you remember those seminarians, you know, from the medieval course, you know, what feudalism was. Uh, it was it was an economic, political order, uh, which was not a free society. Just as in Europe, feudalism in Mexico uh, created a situation where there were there was an aristocracy, Hereditary, and and they uh, they they owned vast estates, the haciendas. You know, they owned vast estates, and uh, many of them were were cash crop. They were plantations essentially. There, there were cash crops uh, production, or uh, there were mines, uh, particularly silver mines like a Potosi, which is very lucrative. But they they ran things. They were the hereditary aristocracy, and they were worked. Uh, just as in Europe, the, the the ones who actually did the work were the serfs, who were not free. They were not slaves in the sense that they were not personally bought and sold, but the serfs in Europe were tied to the land. So that if the estate he worked happened to be sold to someone else, the serf, the serf would stay there. Because it didn't really matter who owned it. He just kept doing the same. The serf kept doing the same thing. Well, in Mexico, the serfs were called the peons. Now, I know that's a pejorative, so I'm not going to, you know, I, but that's at the time, that's what they were called. So I won't use that term since anymore since it's pejorative. But I'll just say the peasants. I know that's also considered pejorative, but I, I just mean those who who were tied to the land. They were not they were not slaves, but they were also not free. And they, they could not own property. And uh, so uh, to understand the divisions in Mexico, the names of political parties would change. But the issue was always land, land reform. Because in order to uh, to create a middle class, as was emerging in the United States, which many of the Mexicans who fought for independence wanted, all all of the territory had, was all part of these big estates. And much of it 
was was not even used, was not even cultivated. Yet, yet the hacendado, the you know the don, the lord, the guy who owned it, did not want to lose his property because maybe you know his son or his grandson or great grandson might want to cultivate that land. Uh, so uh, they always resisted that class of landowners. Always, always, always resisted any movement in any political party that called for land reform. Is that meant they would lose? They would lose land, and if their big estate was carved up, even if it was only the thousands of acres of unused land, if those were carved up, and the former pe- the, for the peasants were then allowed to to get land and have small farms then they would have a source of income, then they would have freedom, and then they, just as happened in Europe and happened in the United States, with that, with income, with, with uh, then they, could, they would have more leisure time, so then they could get educated, they'd have their children educated, and, and their, their, their money and their integration into the economy would mean that they would want to say in government. And if people who, had, who previously had no say in government get a say in government, that means that those who previously had all the power will have that power diluted. So that's why again and again and again, there, there was a, a class, and, and it's still going on. I mean, it's, it's, Mexico has been afflicted by this, you know, and, and, and the, the innocent, I mean, just, you know, end up getting caught in the middle and suffering horribly uh, over this. And this, this was repeated in, in, in Latin America over and over and over again because they had all been colonies of either Spain or Portugal, which did the same thing. And so the same issues over land would keep recurring. All right. So with that, in this, in this early period, uh, early post-colonial period for Mexico, uh, with their attempt at a, at a republic, was, was, was uh, sabotaged, was undermined by this problem of land, which is a problem that the United States did not have because the 13 colonies even though they had been colonies of Great Britain, just as Mexico had been a colony of Spain. But uh, England had already dispensed, had already outlawed serfdom, had already outlawed feudalism by outlawing serfdom. So when the English colonies were formed, there were no serfs. Uh, so, that, that was, so that issue of land reform did not, was not one that the United States Republic had to deal with, whereas the, the, the Republic of Mexico did. And and that's what's gonna that that's that's what con- continually undermined the organic development of Mexico and all, all you know virtually all the other countries in Central America and South America in uh, post colonial times would be this issue. Okay, um, so the um, uh, the government in the eighteen twenty eight election there was a moderate elected uh, Manuel Gomez Pedraza. He defeated. Uh, the liberal, Vincente Guerrero. But then supporters of Guerrero armed themselves and by the the element of surprise and ambush forced the president-elect Pedraza to resign, therefore nullifying the election. And that enabled Guerrero, who actually lost the election, but nevertheless he was the one inaugurated as president, in April of 1829. Eight months later, December of 1829, Guerrero himself was forced out of office. He was kidnapped, put on trial on a series of fabricated charges, uh, and then murdered. But judicially murdered. So judicial murder is when they, they, you know, they concoct some, oh yeah, he's guilty of this. And uh, it, it, you know, which may, you know, it, it doesn't matter if he is or not. It, it's a, it's a, it's a drumhead. I mean, it's a kangaroo. So, of course, he's going to be convicted, and uh, and then executed. So, it wasn't murder; it was execution. You know, it was the, the law. You know, oh, we followed the law. No one's above the law. You know, that's it. So he was murdered. Now, well, how did this happen? This happened with the military. So again, that this is this will repeat in Mexican history and other countries in Latin America. The military sometimes was, was divided, uh, but the officer corps uh, typically were sons of the landowning families, so their their interests were with them, and and these guys, you know, using money, you know, from their families, they could get and they they could get you know uh, soldiers, just the guys who were actually going to do the fighting, 
on their side, you know, to have personal loyalty to them. Uh, and, and then, you know, they use their, their force, the military force, to take over the government to prevent uh, Guerrero, who was a liberal, from enacting any land reform which would hurt their families and their, and their class, their political economic class. So then there's continuing conflict. Uh, these, these two, uh, in the mid-19th century, they solidified, and they had two labels, two party names, the Federalist and the Centralist. All right, now, this, I, I, the Federalist in Mexican history had nothing to do with the Federalist in American, in the United States history. In fact, they were the exact opposite. The Federalist in the United States history were the ones who favored a strong central government. Whereas the Federalists in Mexican history were those who wanted a federation, who believed in the federation of the Mexican states, where the states would have more autonomy. Not complete autonomy. I mean, they did believe, they did want a single country. So the Federalists in Mexican history are those who believed in local control. And local control, you know, that would, that would, that would, that would facilitate land reform. So the other side, the Centralists, are the ones who believed in a, a centralized, a strong centralized government. So that's the military, and that is the the landowning class, the hacendados. So it went on and on like this. The various uprisings uh, caused by various attempts by the Federalists on on in, on state level to implement land reform. Um, and so the hacendados tried. They they supported the centralist political party to try to get control of the central government which would then nullify, erode and nullify the, the power of the local uh, state, state governors, even if they were federalist, from, to prevent them from implementing land reform. Uh, so it went on and on like this. Um, in 1835, um, well, no, I'll skip that. I don't want to get too lost in this. Uh, I said, so um, 1835, uh, the uh, the military, the conservatives, uh, the Hacendado, you know, whatever, the centralist, the centralist party, uh, got control of the of the government. They succeeded, got control of the central government, and they nullified the Federalist Constitution of 1824, which had given the states more power to implement land reform. And the Constitution of 1835 was only seven laws, uh, which which you know essentially just created did what they wanted. It created a strong a, a central government that was so strong. Uh, that state governments did not have the power to implement land reform. Uh, so that went on. Uh, one of the guys was killed. Another one had to rent. It says it went. All right, I'll skip all that. Yeah. Uh, all right. So there was a fight. Essentially, that so there was this, well, there were fights. Civil war after the civil war after civil war, which led to. Uh, Santa Anna, General uh, Antonio uh, Santa Anna, whom we met in the 1830s. Now we meet him again back in the 1830s. Uh, this was the occasion for him uh, to uh, to carry out essentially a coup, a military coup, uh, in, uh, in in March of 1839. At this point, still uh, claiming to be president, so not you know still claiming that that we is a republic, but he's the president. He he lasted this. Eventually, he served he served 11. 11 times as president, though some were very brief, like this one lasted only from March through July of 1839 when he was forced to leave office. Uh, and just in that one year, there were three, three presidents, Santa Ana, Nicolas Bravo, Bustamante. So uh, Bustamante managed to uh, serve two years uh, before he was forced to leave by a rebellion uh, that occurred uh, and that ended up a, a four-sided rebellion Santa Ana being one of them, uh, at the end of which that the fighting went on for two years. Then in uh, 1841, October 1841, Santa Ana became president again in October of 1841. He lasted only a year before the other side hit back, and then he was forced to retreat. Um, th th then, <laughs> Santa, and then again in, in March of 1843, Santa Ana the military took over again. He lasted from March to October of 1843, when the uh, when the Federalists, you know, managed to get control of Mexico City, push him out. Then, uh, uh, kind of, uh, 
cannot, uh, no, anyway, so that, another, and it went on and on like this. Let's see, uh, one guy, Herrera, lasted nine days as president in September of 1844. Uh, he arrested his predecessor, and it, it just, it went on and on. I mean, it's really, tra- you know, that, and, and it's the people that are suffering in all of, and through all of this. Uh, then in 1846, there were uh, rebellions against us. This is these are clowns that are you know they're, they're take, trying to take over Mexico City and get their way. Well, then there were people in the states who said, oh, "Okay, the Federalists, all right, we might believe, agree with your philosophy, but you're not getting the job done." So uh, there were uprising, secession movements where the states. Uh, Mexican states, are, okay, it's just not going to work. So we should just be separate countries. So in Zacatecas and Alta California and Sonora, in uh, what became New Mexico on uh, on the other side, on our side of the United States side of the Rio Grande, uh, Tabasco, uh, um, uh, the Yucatan. So each one of those, there was a uh, separate civil wars, but in the sense of uprisings emancipation uprisings that they wanted to secede as Texas had seceded from Mexico. They said, okay, the, the, this experiment of Republic is not working. So we'll just be like Europe and just have a bunch of small countries. So this was called the Mexican Federalist War, but Federalist in the, in, in the Mexican context, meaning Federalists were actually the states' rights people um, against the centralists that you believe in the strong, the strong central government, which was the military. Even though you had military on both sides, uh, the, the conservative military on the side of the Hacendados were the centralist. But it's called the Mexican Federalist War because it was a war where, where the different states were wanted to just dissolve the republic and be separate countries. Superficially, uh, reading through this, it's a very depressing story. And once again, it's more often the innocent who suffered got in the middle. The war can be viewed as a conflict between rival generals because there were military on both sides. Um, but the uh, the centralist favored a presidency that was be more like a, the viceroy when Mexico was part of the Spanish Empire, and the federalists supported uh, local self government. But the federalists were divided because you know there were some who wanted to remain part of Mexico with just states having strong authority to implement land reform. But then there were other federalists who said we tried and it failed too many times. Let's just be a separate country. So that doomed them to failure, which gave, it gave the you know uh, the uh, the Hacendado alliance, the centralist, an advantage. So Zacatecas um, was a silver mining region in the north of Mexico and strong proponent of federalism, states' rights. Uh, the revolt in Zacatecas was the first rebellion uh, uh, against, uh, since Texas. Texas was just, Texas was the first, and uh, Zacatecas was the second, uh, following the example of Texas, to wanted to secede and create its own republic. Uh, Santa Ana himself, who was a general, he led the Mexican army, in, invaded, you know, in one of the states, Zacatecas. Uh, the rebels were led by a governor, uh, Governor Francisco Garcia Salinas. Uh, Zacatecas, as a state, also had a militia, like we would, we would call the National Guard, that had 4,000 men, uh, against Santa Ana, who was representing the Centralist. Uh, so that, that went on. Uh, and Salinas, because they were divided, because the Federalists were divided between secessionists and those who wanted to stay in the Republic, but just with strong states' rights, they were divided. So they, they you know, Santa Ana played divide and conquer, defeated this uh, secessionist movement at the Battle of Zacatecas in 1835. Um, let's see. Uh, then Santa Ana's troops pillaged Zacatecas, considering it enemy territory, leaving the region embittered against him. Uh, but Zacatecas did surrender, which meant that the centralist, the Hacendado allies in the military, got control of the silver mines in Zacatecas. Uh, Texas, we already covered their secession, uh, so I won't repeat all of that. Uh, that culminated the Battle of San Jacinto, April 21st, 1836, uh, where Santa Ana was captured. The Texans defeated the Mexicans and captured Santa Ana. 
in the midst of all of this, there was a uh, France invaded Mexico uh, because uh, Mexico had defaulted on uh, on some loans to French banks. So the French invaded to try to force uh, force payment. Uh, they blockaded the French Navy blockaded uh, Veracruz on the on the uh, eastern side of Mexico, the the Gulf of Mexico side. Um, diplomatic relations were broken off. This is called the Pastry War. I, I mean, it, it's just—it's such a tragedy what happened to, you know, what happened to Mexico, and it still is. Except now it's drug dealers versus the police. It's—it's it's just you know, and uh, I, 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 in my person, I think it's because that, you know, Catholicism had, had been so deeply embedded in Mexico that it, that's why it's been subject to continual satanic attack like this. Because it, it's this is so often it's just the innocent that are caught in the middle of all of this. And end up dying. Uh, so uh, they made a deal where Mexico did uh, paid some of the French debt, and then uh, satisfied the rest of the obligation by dra- granting trade concessions to the French to have a permanent uh, trade base in in Veracruz. And it went on. This is just a few examples of uh, this is what was going on when Ambassador Slidell went to Mexico City. And made the offer to buy all the territory north of the Rio Grande from Mexico. And uh, it just in that one year, Mexico had gone through four presidents violently. You know, it wasn't a result of just parliament. I mean, violently because of the fighting. So when Santa Ana experienced a military reversal, then then a Federalist would be put in. But then when Santa Ana would regroup and come back, then the Federalist had to retreat or he was assassinated. Then the Santa Ana would come back. So they weren't in a position to, you know, even if they wanted to. And there were some in Mexico who wanted to. They said, okay, let's sell them that territory. It's sparsely populated anyway. We'll get the money from the United States and we'll get an alliance. And maybe the United States would send troops to help our side against the other side. But the government wasn't stable enough, stable long enough to carry through that policy because they, they were going, all this is a civil war, a long, recurring civil war. Uh, okay, so uh, Mexico asserted, uh, well, admission of Texas to the Union. No, let me see. I, I want to give you all the dates. Um, the offer was not accepted. The offer to buy Texas was not accepted. Nevertheless, uh, the, the, the project was carried through, and four new states were admitted to the Union, two south of the Mason-Dixon line, which would have slavery, and two north of the Mason-Dixon line, which would not. So uh, the sequence was as follows. Florida was admitted as the 27th state on March 3rd, 1845. Texas was admitted as the 28th state on December 29th, 1845. Even though Mexico did not recognize the secession of Texas, so they they regarded this as the United States stealing uh, Mexican territory. And then, uh, so both of those were south of the Mason-Dixon line. The two north of the Mason-Dixon line were state, uh, Iowa was admitted as state 29 on December 28th, 1846. And Wisconsin admitted as state 30 on May 29th, uh, 1848. So uh, here's uh, Texas, Texas and Florida, in the south. Texas and Florida in the south, and then north of the Mason-Dixon line. Here, this is right there. Is uh, Wisconsin. Wisconsin and Iowa, which is right shares shares part of the border. The um, mechanics of admitting Texas to the Union involved the United States in a dispute over the boundaries of Texas. Um, 
Mexico, of course, never never recognized the secession of Texas, so naturally it refused to accept the Texan claim that its southern border was the Rio Grande River. Mexico asserted that the border of the province, claiming to be the Republic of Texas, had in fact been further north, the Nueces River, north of the Rio Grande. So in geographical terms, the Rio Grande claim gave Texas, and therefore the United States, land on the Gulf of Mexico south to Brownsville, whereas the Nueces boundary would give Mexico land on the Gulf north to Corpus Christi Bay. The United States supported the Texas claim to the Rio Grande border, and that is what triggered the war. But before we get to that, so sticking to the chronology, uh, back to church history, 1846, the same year that the United States would end up going to war with Mexico over that border dispute, the Order of St. Benedict established its first foundation in the United States. This process introduces us to Abbot Boniface Vimmer, W-I-M-M-E-R, lived from 1809 to 1887. Uh, Wimmer was born in Bavaria, southern Germany, baptized with the name Sebastian. His parents were uh, Peter, Peter and Elizabeth. They were tavern keepers. Uh, so they owned their own business, family business, and the family lived above the tavern. He studied at Regensburg and at Munich, both in Bavaria, then won a scholarship to study at the Gregorian University in Rome. He was ordained a priest for Bavaria, so we would think of as a diocesan priest, you know, to work in parishes uh, back in Bavaria. He was ordained on August 1st, 1831. Returning home, he was assigned to work at the Shrine of Our Lady of Altatin in Bavaria. This was during the lifetime of King Ludwig I of Bavaria, of the House of Wittelsbach. Uh, he reigned from 1825 to 1848. Now, remember, uh, Germany was not a unified country. As we saw in the medieval period, uh, uh, Germany, you know, it, it's, a, it's a cultural expression and a, a linguistic expression. There is a common culture and language. Uh, but uh, as far as the Middle Ages, they had over 300 separate sovereignties of different sizes. Some were kingdoms, some principalities, some counties, duchies, margravates, landgraves um, that were all separate uh, sovereignties. So Germany was not unified as a single country until 1870. So Bavaria in the south uh, was a kingdom, was an independent kingdom, and it was Catholic. Uh, Bavaria and Swabia remained Catholic even after the Protestant uh, wars. So Ludwig I... Um, Big, it was uh, it was a devout Catholic, began restoring Benedictine monasteries in Bavaria. They had all been closed or destroyed or abandoned during the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. One such abbey was the Benedictine Abbey of St. Michael in the town of Metten, Bavaria. Uh, it was a, a historic foundation originally established in the year 766 during the reign of Charlemagne was established by Benedictine missionary monks from the Italian Abbey of Monte Cassino. Wimmer uh, had visited Monte Cassino when he was a student in Rome. Monte Cassino is not in Rome, but it's it's you know it's in Italy. It's outside Rome, so um, and the and the monastery was still there. The historic monastery founded by Saint Benedict himself on the top of Monte Cassino was still there. And uh, you know, he just saw it as a you know it was a pilgrimage sort of thing. But then when he goes back home and, and his king is, wants to actively promote reviving Benedictine monasticism in Bavaria, he was inspired and, and he volunteered. So he, he requested permission from his bishop. Permission was granted. And uh, he and a group of others like him, other young priests like him, uh, were, went back to, went to Monte Cassino, but this time as novices to, to, you know, to be trained. Even though they were already priests, they had to be you know, trained in the you know the religious the religious way before taking vows, um, and in religion, which is the custom of the Benedictines, he was given a new name, so the name was Boniface. 
uh, who was also a monk in the Middle Ages, who was uh, one of the, as you call the Apostle of Germany, he's one of those that evangelized uh, the Germans from paganism in the medieval period. Uh, so this works, and um, he becomes a Benedictine. Well, he, he's, he's reading about Germans who, uh, who moved to the United States after the Napoleonic Wars ended, and uh, he read that they were being neglected sacramentally because they did not have enough priests who spoke German. And at the time, according to the figures at his disposal, there were one and a half million German Catholics in the United States. And uh, he contacted, you know, people to, uh, he, he investigated. To investigate, he contacted the Leopold Society, uh, of, of which is Vienna. It was a, a, a group, a Catholic beneficent society established in Vienna, Austria, in 1829 for the purpose of assisting uh, German-speaking Catholics in foreign lands. Between its founding in 1829 and the First World War, which began in 1914 and erased all of this, it sent $700,000 to such German Catholic communities in the United States. And in the 19th century, $700,000 was a lot of money. In a foreboding indication of conflicts to come, Rumors reached this Leopold Society in Austria that Irish bishops and priests in the United States were taking these donations from the Leopold Society and using them for their own projects, projects other than serving German Catholics. And, of course, they heard the Irish clergy were not going to learn German, you know, to preach to the Germans. They expected the Germans to learn English since they were in the United States. Uh, therefore, after hearing this, the Leopold Society dispatched one of its members, a priest, Austrian priest, Father Josef Salzbacher, who was stationed at the Cathedral of St. Stephen in Vienna, to investigate. So he traveled across the ocean and with characteristic Teutonic diligence. Uh, he landed in New York on April 17, 1842. He visited 11 dioceses in 17 states that had large German Catholic populations. He published the results in book form. And uh, so he's, he's, and Wimmer had read his book and then wrote to him personally. So Salzbacher confirmed uh, his personal observations that the Irish Catholic clergy in the United States were indeed neglecting, neglecting German Catholics in the, in the sense that, you know, that these guys, from their perspective, if the Irish were not learning German to speak to them in German, therefore the Irish were neglecting them. Whereas the Irish, their, their response would have been, well, it's 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 actually it would actually help, it's helping them to not speak to them in German because then they have to learn English, and as other immigrant groups learned, without learning English, they would always be at a disadvantage in the United States. So those two sides. Yeah. Uh, another source of uh, in information uh, Vemmer found was within the monastic network. The Abbey of Our Lady of the Hermits in Einsiedeln, Switzerland, was also active in helping German Catholic. Uh, immigrants to the United States. And uh, those monks at Einsiedeln eventually did establish a foundation uh, in the United States in March of 1854, St. Meinrid's Abbey in Indiana. But they were not the first. Vimmer was the first. St. Meinrid's was established a decade after Vimmer's. Uh, on November 8, 1845, Vimmer published his thoughts and intentions uh, and, and circulated it in pamphlet form in Germany and Austria. It is a strikingly candid revelation of the ecclesiology of a monastic religious in the mid-19th century, whose labor substantially impacted Catholicism in the United States, and gives us an indication of the, uh, the conflicts of the immigrant church, e even with the same religion, and going to the United States for a fresh start, Yet even within, there were conflicts based on culture and ethnic hatred. So Satan, you know, just, just uses this. So uh, his uh, statement read in part, quote, Every Catholic who cherishes his faith, faith must take a deep interest in missionary labors. But religion, as well as patriotism, demands that every German Catholic should take a special interest 
in the missions of America. To us, it cannot be a matter of indifference how our countrymen are situated in America. I, for my part, have not been able to read the various and generally sad reports of the desolate condition of Germans beyond the ocean without deep compassion and a desire to do something to alleviate their pitiable condition. It is not difficult to understand what must be done. More German-speaking priests should be found laboring for the spiritual welfare of our countrymen in America. The only question is how to get these priests and what kind of priest will do the work most successfully. The answer to the second question will give the solution to the first. I do not wish to offend anyone, but my opinion is that secular priests are not the best adapted for missionary labors. So I'll interrupt there. Secular priest means parish priest. That's, you know, me. Is that a parish priest, diocesan priest? All right, back to the quote. History shows that the church has not availed herself of their services to any great extent in missionary undertakings. They cannot support themselves. They are in great danger of becoming careless and worldly-minded. Unless such a missionary be a saint, not much of the spiritual would remain in him. And even then, by such transient visits, not much lasting good could be accomplished. The missionary, more than any other priest, stands in need of spiritual renewal from time to time, consolation and advice in trials and difficulties. He must, therefore, have some place where he can find such assistance. This may be given him by his bishop, but he will find it more securely in a religious community, in the midst of his confreres. He should have a home to receive him in his old age or when he is otherwise incapacitated for missionary labor. He should have no other worldly cares. Otherwise, he might neglect or even forget his own and others' spiritual welfare. All this can be had in a religious community. The next question is, what religious order is most adapted for the American missions? Not to convert the Indians, but to provide for the spiritual necessities of German immigrants. All right, I'll pause there. He then lists a number of different types of orders. You know, the Jesuits, which had done, and Franciscans, which had done such missionary, important missionary work in the New World. Uh, And he lists, lists a bunch of others. So the one he wants is at the end, so I'll just skip down at the end, uh, picking up the quote. We now come to the Benedictines, who are not as yet represented in the United States. In my opinion, they are the most competent to relieve the great lack of priest in America. The Benedictine order, by its rule, is so constituted that it can readily adapt itself to all times and every circumstance. The contemplative and practical are harmoniously blended. Agriculture, manual labor, literature, missionary work, education, were all drawn into the circle of activity which St. Benedict placed before his disciples. He then goes on extolling the, but he, so you get the point. Um, and he then summarizes his plan. His plan was uh, to take Benedictines to the United States, establish one location in the United States, spend two years building it up, making it self-sufficient, then building a school, a printing press, etc. And then, uh, with uh, So he wanted to bring uh, two or three priests and 10 to 15 brothers who were skilled in the trades to do this, to build a, a religious colony. And for seminarians, those who took the medieval course, uh, you know that that's exactly what his namesake, St. Saint, Saint Boniface, did. That's how Boniface evangelized Germany. He was a Benedictine, and it was missionary monasticism. That you know that you go, you found a religious colony somewhere. For all the reasons he indicated, it would be self-sufficient, had its own food, have its own base of operations, uh, and the individuals would have support and could easily be replaced when they get sick. Um, and then when it grows enough, you know, you cultivate vocations, you get more. Well, then you can then some of those can be sent to establish a new house, a new religious colony. 
Okay, so in pursuit of the, this was successful. This appeal was successful in raising funds. And he got, you know, he got permission and support to do this. So Father Boniface Vimmer, with 18 companions, embarked from Rotterdam, a port, in uh, July 1846, aboard the steamer USS Iowa. In September of 1846, the Most Reverend Michael O'Connor, founding bishop of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, offered them a base, offered them a location. Now, it was not, a, not an abbey because, you know, the Benedictines weren't there yet, but it was an ecclesiastical foundation. He offered them pastoral responsibility for St. Vincent's Parish, located 40 miles southeast of Pittsburgh in, well, what is now Westmoreland County. Vimmer accepted, and he arrived with his companions on October 19, 1846. They found, already built, a small brick church, a barn, and a log cabin. So now, uh, Vimmer brought with him uh, aspirants, those who, you know, but they, were, they had not taken solemn vows yet. He wanted them to see, not only, not just the ideal, oh yeah, we're going to be missionaries, but see what the life was actually going to be. So once they saw what it was, he then asked them, okay, now you can choose. Do you want to take your vows, and this will be your life, or not? You know, you're free. You're in the United States. It's a free country. At least it was then. Uh, so, you know, you can do whatever you want. You can go back home or you can stay here, you, you know, or, or, but not, you know, but not as a, uh, uh, not as a monk. You can just, you know, or, or, or whatever. And he told him sleep on it, you know, and, uh, the next day, not one backed out. They all, they all stayed. So the, then they made their vows and Vimmer invested the 18 with the habit on October 24th, 1846. Two years later, they opened a school, uh, at, at St. Vincent's Priory. And they, they followed his plan, building it up. <clears throat> Until by August 24th, 1855, Pope Pius IX, granting Vimmer's request, elevated St. Vincent's to the status of an abbey, from a, you know, from a priory to an abbey, and named Vimmer, uh, of course, as the founding abbot. Uh, at the time, St. Vincent's Abbey had 200 monks. So starting with uh, um, 18, well, 19, including Vimmer, it had grown from 1846 to 1855 to 200 monks. And they were self-sufficient. They ground their own flour. They raised their own crops. Uh, they, and they brewed their own beer. P purely for medicinal purposes, you understand. During Vimmer's 40 years, as abbot, 40 years, he sent out monks to establish six new abbeys. St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota. 1856, St. Benedict's in Atchison, Kansas, 1857, Mary, Help of Christians in Belmont, North Carolina, 1876, St. Bernard's in Cullman, Alabama, 1876, St. Procopius in Lyle, Illinois, and in this 1886, but in the same year, 1886, also Holy Cross in Cannon City, Colorado. And uh, that last one closed in 2006. Uh, and more were established after his death, you know, as the, as the process continued. And further, monks from those in turn served as missionary priests, establishing 152 parishes in 25 states. And uh, Vimmer died on December 8th, 1887, still uh, at his post. Okay, well, uh, stop there, because uh, next we go into the Mexican-American War, uh, 1846 to 1848. So for now, uh, we'll pause here. Thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned. <laughs>